Welcome back to another video exploring more of the many hidden secrets in Cyberpunk 2077. As usual, we're going to be looking at specific interesting encounters found in the game before figuring out how they connect to wider storylines as well as other pop culture. So sit back, relax, and get ready to uncover yet another five curious hidden secrets in Night City. Let's get to it. First up, turns out Soul Killer isn't just tech used on the super wealthy to immortalize them inside Mikoshi, but rather it's also a soul imprisonment tactic apparently used on troublesome netrunners. The reported crime, another circle of hell found down in southern Japantown, involves us parkouring our way up to this roof. Atop it, we'll have to take down a griffin drone which appears to be sporting the orange colors of Kang Tao. Though actually, as we'll soon learn, it was deployed by Kendachi, who also sometimes sport the same orange. It, seemingly, had some involvement in in the takedown of this netrunner, named Dante, who, as we can read, was commissioned a gig to steal data from Brandon Holt. That's the cousin of Weldon Holt, who's standing for mayor in direct opposition to Jefferson Perales. The idea is to get some incriminating details on Brandon, namely some dirty recordings of him in Mexico, in order to drag the entire Holt name through the mud. Now, who commissioned this gig is unclear. Maybe it was Jefferson's team, maybe it was the 6th Street branch already trying to tarnish Holt's name. Hell, maybe it was even Night Corp themselves. Though, since the client is referred to as him, we can assume it's mainly one guy, so potentially Jefferson or Blue Eyes. Anyway, Dante, wanting to make himself a quick buck, got to work right away. And according to this Kandachi infolog beside him, he was able to get into the system, accessing a whole four years of Brandon's exploits in Mexico. However, on attempting to download the first file, a failsafe was triggered, at which point the log devolves into something more codified. One word that we can make out at the end, however, is simply soul. And making our way over to Dante's hideout in order to loot all of his stuff, we can- what? Oh come on, he's not going to need it anymore, this is how all the reported crimes go. In fact, for this one, we're gifted a Breach Protocol skill shard, a tad ironic, and a biomonitor for our trouble. But the more interesting thing here lies in Dante's terminal, where we can read an email between him and Shang Hu Nam, Wakako's favourite fixer from the Wakako's favourite gig. Check out my video on the Westbrook gigs for more info on him, he's a decent guy. Which is probably why Dante reached out to him, except having now been soul killed, Dante is only able to communicate in binary. Fortunately, other people on the internet had already translated this, with the title reading Pomotse, which in Polish I believe means help. The rest however translates to English, reading quotes, help. You gotta help, they trapped me. Chang Hu then replies, what do you mean? Where? Dante then says, in the net, it was soul killer, help. To which Chang Hu simply says, oh my god, Dante, I I don't know what to do, I really don't." End quotes. Yeah, it's a crap situation to be in, and unless a new body can be found for Dante, he is now trapped permanently as an engram inside what I can only assume is Mikoshi. Except here's the interesting thing. Mikoshi is a product of Arasaka, and Kandachi, whilst being another Japanese corporation, are a separate company. So does this mean Arasaka hire out Soul Killer to a select few other corps? And what interest is there in trapping this guy's engram? Surely if they wanted to stop him accessing the files, they could just kill him. Do they want to interrogate him about something? And if so, what? We know that Weldon is very much in the pockets of the corpse, we can see as much through the cameras at Kempeki Plaza, and probably all the corpos other than Night Corp still want Holt to win the next election. But again, why does stealing files from the man's cousin warrant being soul killed? Well, maybe the title, Another Circle of Hell, plays a bit of a part here. There's other references to the circles of hell throughout the rest of the game, in some big underlying story conspiracy. We have Lilith has concealed the 10th circle from the ancestor's eyes, a quote which comes up during one of the cyber psycho sightings and a Gary the Prophet quest. It has something to do, I think, with rogue AIs from beyond the black wall starting to take over the world or something. I'm gonna have to dedicate a whole video to it, so for the time being, share your theories down in the comments below. And now, it's on to number two. Probably one of the most well-known facts about this game is that it features Keanu Reeves playing a main character. However, what's less well-known is the effort the devs went to to sneak in several references to other Keanu Reeves movies elsewhere around Night City. Down in the centre of the Glen, for example, just off from the Palms View Way fast travel points, head just off the street to these ventilation units. Up these steps, we can find a guy who fell to his death, when the walkway he was on seemingly collapsed. Upon seeing the man, Johnny will say this. Yeah. Fuck. And, reading the guy's shard, we can learn just why. What we see is a somewhat familiar conversation to fans of The Matrix between this guy, John Anderson, and somebody named Orpheus. 
or or per 3U5 to be very literal. Obviously, it's a reference to the scene in The Matrix when Neo is encouraged to leave his office block by climbing down a scaffolding, it being the only way to escape and avoid the custody of the agents. Now, the convo doesn't quite match point for point the conversation in the film, but the gist is pretty much the same. Orpheus, in this case, directs Anderson across the office and out onto a ledge. Though, in this case, it's towards an actual emergency exit and not a scaffolding. Now, in the movie, Neo decides that potentially falling to his death is probably worse than getting arrested, so leaves the office with the agents, a move which still ultimately works out okay in the end for the movie. But in the case of John Anderson, he decided to try his luck, and well, things didn't end the way he wanted them to. It doesn't look like he lost his footing, but rather the entire platform he was on was entirely unstable. It's an interesting mirror to what could have happened to Neo, and thus this reaction from Johnny might actually be a cool fourth wall break realisation. Also, in attempting to find more info, I carefully scaled the building from which Anderson had fallen, and nah, there's nothing. In fact, there's no way we were ever even supposed to come up here, since some of these textures aren't even solid. My my guess then is that Anderson had caught the attention of some megacorp, take your pick which, and Orpheus was a netrunner working with him and getting him out of the building before he got caught up to. Though it's anyone's guess now, what exactly happened to Orpheus? Heading up into North Oak next for a little look into what its alleged residents get up to. The reported crime, Table Scraps, follows the story of Jalapeno Joe, a homeless guy with a revolutionary idea to set himself up in the richest part of Night City and feed off of the much higher quality waste that these top 0.1% throw out. His idea, obviously, is short-lived, and so is he once he starts doing this. We can find him just outside this tunnel down from Carrie's house, having just been taken out by an Arasaka hit squad something which may come into play later. But first, on Joe's body, there's a convo between him and Kadeem Brown, where Joe boasts about how great it is being up in Norfolk. What with all the clothes, fresh food, and even sometimes implants, he can find just laying around. Although when Kadeem suggests joining him up there, Joe literally threatens to kill the guy, claiming it's his turf and he'd take out anyone who tries to step foot in it. In fact, he's already done so to a few people who tried it, which can be found at his little hideout under the bridge. You see, somehow, Joe was able to acquire a handful of proximity mines to protect himself from anyone who came snooping, possibly explaining why Arasaka took him down in the open away from home. It's not only a little safer, but also quieter and explosion-free. Don't want to be disturbing those wealthy North Oak residents after all. Of course, us being friends, or at the very least acquaintances with all of them personally, I'm sure they won't mind if we do. Joe, as you might expect, has a sweet bugger all of value, save for some steel toe cap boots which someone must have chucked. What is interesting though is the communications on Joe's laptop and the information he acquired during his time up here. Firstly, we have a warning from someone named Bobby, saying what we all probably knew already, that anyone who tries to slum it up here is going to be quietly removed, probably just to maintain the neighbourhood aesthetic, though who knows, maybe they're kidnapped for some form of experimentation as well. Second is a message from Gobby. That's the same name with a G instead of a B. Gobby is asking for help from Joe, and similar to Kadeem, is hoping to stay with him up at North Oak. Again, Joe's status as North Oak resident has gone straight to his head, as he outright refuses to lend any hand, as well as berating him for not using a tilde on the jalapeno N in his name, used to connote a double N sound, which I guess makes his name a more Spanish jalapeno Joe? Yeah. This guy has an overinflated sense of self-importance for Defo. The most interesting thing here, though, is Joe's observations of the North Oak properties. Now, if we look at the map, there are literally only three properties up here. I imagine there's canonically supposed to be more, but equally, Joe does only observe three different properties in total. What's fun is trying to determine which is which. We, of course, have Carrie's house, Denny's house, and the Arasaka residence. And I'm pretty certain at who must be who. House 104 reads, quote, Home all day, doesn't leave, nothing of note in trash, better avoid, end quote. Now, the doesn't leave part sounds a lot like the Carrie that we first meet, though I wouldn't necessarily say Carrie's trash would be entirely uninteresting, I'd pin that part more on Arasaka. House 103 reads, quote, Miss 103 works nights, leaves house around 10.30 to 11pm, back no earlier than 6am. Trash, expired medications, food waste, cigarette butts, electric fence, end quote. 
yeah, my money's on Danny for this one. Working nights could fit if she's still drumming, and her house does have those fence bits amongst the wall bits, which could have been electrified before Henry drove a cement truck through one of them, breaking the circuit. Now, that leaves 102, which can only therefore really be the Arasaka residence, making this pretty interesting. Quote, Mr. 102 leaves home, 7.15 to 7.20 a.m., enters parked Delamain. Miss 102 jogging with bodyguard around 8 a.m., sex with bodyguard around 8.45 to 9 a.m., leaves house around 10 a.m., back no earlier than 5 to 8 p.m., trash, unfinished takeout, sushi, electronics, clothes, end quote. Yeah, so it's not entirely clear who lives at the Arasaka residence most of the time, but initially, based on the devil ending, I thought maybe Hanako and Yorinobu, which would mean Hanako and her bodyguard Oda are a lot closer than we realise. However, since those two aren't permanent NC residents, another potential set of candidates could be Michiko Arasaka, their niece, and therefore her husband Mark Sanderson. We don't have much to do with them in the game, but Michiko does crop up in the devil ending. And in some of the older lore, she did have a fling with Adam Smasher, of all people. So a prime candidate may be to have a thing for her bodyguards. Equally, it's more likely Mark would take a Delamain than Yorinobu, who'd probably choose to fly in an AV. The sushi found in the trash could potentially also point towards Arasaka, since sushi originated in Southeast Asia, and we know from Takamura that Night City's regular food is utterly terrible compared to Japan's. Although, that all said, these descriptions might not correspond to the these properties at all, but instead other ones which were cut from the game. Still, it's fun to dive into in order to try and gleam a little more info about these mega rich characters. Hell, maybe the reason Joe had an Arasaka hit squad come for him was because he'd been peeping in on either Hanako or Michiko with their bodyguards. Plus, he also scrounged their leftover sushi. For our fourth item on this list, we want to come over to Little China, a ways up the road from the Riot Club until we're standing outside Caliente. Then, heading behind towards a garage with two turrets outside, it seems this guy realised the imminent danger he was in and fled the scene. This guy, however, did not. Anyway, open up the garage this place was protecting and we find yet another Netrunner Den. Honestly, I've lost count now of how many of these garages are actually Runner Dens in disguise, though this one's got a pretty cool story. Coming to the terminal, we can learn that the runner in question question was named Shiva, an ambitious woman who apparently has harboured hopes of joining the Voodoo Boys for quite a while. And finally, her opportunity seems to present itself when she gets offered a job by them. However, to dive the depths she needs to to complete the job, she's going to need better equipment. And who does she go to but the most morally sound fixer in town, Regina Jones. In this case though, Regina isn't much help, saying she isn't Santa Claus and doesn't let people pay on credits. She also doesn't even have what Shiva's after, and then she offers some very light discouragement against what Shiva's doing, to which Shiva should definitely have listened. See, over in the tub, Shiva has sadly flatlined, with her vitals overheating due to the very thing she sought to prevent. On her is a convo between her and Jean Kira, the voodoo boy who commissioned the gig. And here's another interesting tie-in. If you saw my Kabuki Gigs video, then you'd know all about the Soviet fixer Mikhail Akulov on a business trip to Night City for unknown reasons. We break into his apartment and steal some data and one of the gigs as well as planting a bug on his car in another for Regina. And it turns out Regina isn't the only one interested in spying on the guy. The Voodoo Boys also want to know why he's been poking around Pacifica. Now we know that it all has something to do with some mutual spy game between the Soviets and the Chinese, though I guess the Voodoo Boys are just looking out for themselves, which would explain why they really don't give a damn about Shiva for failing her mission. They probably just went and found someone else to do it straight after. In fact, to take it a step further, I'd bet they wouldn't have followed through on their offer even if she had succeeded. After all, they treat us like a disposable floor rag and it makes sense that they treat her the same. Hell, maybe she did succeed and they in fact offed her themselves so as to not have to fulfil their promise. It's funny, because had Shiva cut past the voodoo boys and gone straight to Regina, no doubt she could have still done the same job without having to deal with that very shady gang. So to all of you who voted to join the voodoo boys on this poll that I posted a while ago, like, are you sure about that? You'd probably have better chances with the animals, or hell, maybe even Maelstrom.
For our final spot today, we're heading out into the far badlands, literally into the middle of nowhere. A whole drive away from the nearest fast travel points into this obscure collection of rocks. Amongst it is a solitary RV, some equipment, and a whole load of landmines and turrets protecting the thing. Seems whatever operation is going on here is pretty important to someone. However, it seems even with all of this protection, it couldn't fully protect the guys from an attack. And on their bodies, we can learn their story. Or mainly, this guy's story. James James Reddington is the self-proclaimed man who invented glitter, clearly serving as a cyberpunk equivalent to Walter White's for this reference. And Jin Araki, his former co-worker, I suppose serves as Jesse Pinkman, claiming they actually invented it together. However, seemingly unhappy with the lack of credit he's receiving, Walt, uh, James, decides to strike out on his own, no longer producing glitter for the Tiger Claws, and instead going to work for the Wraiths. Now, glitter, by the way, is a highly addictive and harmful substance, which sort the stands in as the game's bad drug with their huge underground markets. Anyway, the Wraiths set Walt, sorry, James, up in the desert with this RV, and it's actually them who provide all of these defenses, protecting their investments. In fact, there's a second shard on the table here, outlining everything they've provided him to cook with, including acid-resistant clothes, potentially yellow ones like in the show, not that we see that. So, actually, rather than the Wraiths raiding the place and killing everyone here like I'd first assumed, I'd actually guess that the Wraiths were rushing to James Reddington's aid after he was tracked down by his former business partners in order to take out the competition. Ironically, the Wraiths appear to have been taken out by the very defences they put in place, and still too late to save James. See, I reckon these tigers arrived on the scene, getting past the security measures before shooting five bullet holes in the door. That's actually the most Breaking Bad easter egg part of this encounter. They're literally in the same five dice shape as in the show, but unlike the show, he was afterwards actually shot against this wall, and so the inventor of glitter actually died before he could go on to found some ginormous drug empire, which in this world is actually probably for the best. There's enough tyrants hanging about the place as it is. Another is the last thing we need. Still, a cool little easter egg, and a nice way to reference an incredible TV show whilst also fleshing out a small storyline from the game itself. I'd recommend checking it out, if you can find it in the middle of nowhere that is. Again, I do plan to do more of these provided I can find more more encounters with enough detail to be talked about at length. I love uncovering and connecting the hidden secrets in this game, whether they're huge conspiracies or just clever nods. So comment below any more encounters you've found which you think could hint to something greater, and I'll do my best to cover them in the future. As always, huge thanks to the amazing supporters over on Patreon for helping to keep the channel alive. I am forever grateful to you guys for your continued support. And finally, thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you soon in another video.